The gracious God, we thank the Lord again for being here, O oh God. Yes. Lord, we made this song our theme song some time ago. Yes. Out of honor to your word and our desire, O oh God, to go deeper in your word. Yes. Lord, I believe you honor that request that we made, and you continue, God, progressively to take us deeper into more and more truth, O oh Lord. Yes. Now, God, we're excited about hearing what you're going to say yes. the rest of the way down, O oh God. Yes. We come here with anticipation, we come here with open ears, with open hearts, open minds. We pray, oh God, that you'll fill all of them, oh God. Our hearts, our minds, our ears. Let us leave here, oh God, filled to the overflow, oh God. More determined than ever to finish this race that's been set before us, oh God. We pray, Lord, tonight for those who have come, that you'll bless them, oh Lord, for their obedience, for their faithfulness to your word, oh God. We pray for those who came here sick tonight, that you will, right now, Lord, walk around this congregation and touch them personally, Lord. Yes. Heal them, O oh Lord. Yes. Deliver them, O oh God. Yes. Those of God who are just carrying burdens, O oh Lord, that they don't even know how to deal with them. How to deal with them. We pray, O oh God, that you will give them solutions tonight. Yes. Yes. Meanwhile, God, you pray, O oh Lord, you'll take their burdens off their mind as the word goes forward. Yes. Let it not be a hindrance to your word, my yes. God. Yes. Now, as long as God, we pray that you'll speak your word. Yes. That you'll open up our, our hearts, that you'll open up our thoughts, oh God, that you'll open our ears up, oh Lord. Yes. And let these things sink deep down into them, oh God. Yes. Not to ever be moved or jarred or misplaced or replaced. But let your word, oh God, have its top priority, oh Lord, in our hearts, yes. in our minds, in our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Paul is giving advice to a young minister named Timothy. And Jordan, I think He's giving him a charge. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He makes this charge on the fact that he'll judge the quick and the dead in his appearing in his kingdom. What's his advice to Timothy? Preach the word. Preach the word. I looked at that another way some time ago. In the beginning, was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word 
was God. That's John chapter 1, verse 1. Then in verse 14. And the word. became flesh and dwelt amongst us and we beheld his glory, the glory as only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Looking at this, Paul could just as easily tell Timothy. Preach Jesus. Preach Jesus, Timothy, you'll cover everything. Be instant, in season, out of season. An instance here is to be ready in any situation to preach the word that's needed, whether it's correction or reproof or rebuke. And do with all long suffering, and when you correct, reprove, rebuke, rebuke, and exhort. Do it with the word, with the doctrine. Why? For the time will come when they will not endorse some doctrine. I can tell you, and it could be the time is here. Which has caused most preachers to quit preaching the word. For the most part, church is a good place to go to get a cheap show. By the way. Or it depends on how much money to take on my dad, an expensive show. I uh, I've been watching a lot of church services. And I can see how God is sick of this church. Number one, there's no word being preached. At all. It's the church's way of saying. We're sick of manna. We want quail because we like it. And we enjoy quail. We want something we enjoy. And so the preachers, most of them being hirelings, anyhow, not called by God, they give them what they want. They're turning service into a joy service. I wish I could get away with that during my preaching career. For the time will come and they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. The reference there is to the teachers having itching ears. You know, Whatever you do, whatever performance or the radio you're performing, either you're good or you're not. You know? Right now they're showing exhibition football games. I watched on the Browns game Monday night to see how Johnny Manziel is going to perform. He's their, their hope. Neither he, who's the rookie quarterback, nor the incumbent quarterback, played a very good game. And of course, when they did the interview with the coach afterwards, he didn't have too much good to say about either one of them. One sports commentator said, it's like both guys are trying not to get the starting job. <laughs> That's the way they play. But after you do something and you know you're, you're good at it, how many accolades do you need? How often or how long do you somebody tell you you're good? Either you are or you're not, and if nobody tells you you are, you still know you are if you are. Right? And if you're good until you're not good, you still know you're good. And if you're good and you're not good, you're not good. <laughs> He got, he's saying his last days are going to come a new brand of teachers 
who have itching ears who want to constantly hear how good they are. They want that pat in the back. I love it when you come by after a message. You shake my hand. It's a good message. But just, you know, it means more come from some than others because some listen more than others, but it means more to us. Some of you have turned into real scholars. And yeah. so I get so mad about the folks on the internet who dare criticize you. This always makes me mad. They criticize the ministry. I was going to ask them, who are you preaching to each week? And the congregation serves as a check and balance system. I can't get away with coming and telling you all anything. I'm going to teach you guys a word for 30 years. I can't even come in and just, you know, sham my way through. I feel like sometimes, you know, I look at the clock as much as you are, hoping we can get out. <laughs> but I still can't just say, okay, well, let's just go home now. I'm tired. I got to finish the message. If it involves me staying here longer, then I want to be here. Because they have vision ears, it says they shall, people, the listeners shall keep to themselves to eat. I've been around different people's houses. For some reason, like when I come, they got to turn on some preaching. <laughs> <laughs> then they ask me, make the terrible mistake of asking me, do you like this one? I get T.D. Jakes. I said, no, not really. <laughs> well, do you like, do you like Purple Dollar? I'm not crazy about it. Then do I get curious? And go, well, what's wrong? You know, he reads in the Bible. That's what they all do. Satan would have a false prophet come up and read from the book of Kangaroo. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a good giveaway. <laughs> then I'll read from a regular text. Read from God's Word. Then proceed to not write and divide it. Or just twist it and make it say something that it shouldn't say. My personal opinion, if these men have been called by the Spirit, led by the Spirit, they ought to be preaching an end times message. Just that simple. I mean, think about it. How many times, how many, how many occasions have you turned on the radio or TV and heard somebody talk about the seven churches? That's the message to the church, to seven churches. You can preach up to seven churches. I'm going to get realized now for the last 2,000 years, but more so now than ever. Their congregation has no idea what the letter to the church is. They have no idea that those are letters written to seven churches that are a prophecy in type, and it talks about the history of the church from Pentecost, 1831, to the time of church of Eve. And I can understand why someone stay away from it. It's like sometimes you're personal reading. You start reading your Bible. And the first verse you read hits you. You're going to go like that. I'll get back to it later on. And lo and behold, later on, two days later, you open your Bible and it's the same page. <laughs> That's the little guy's really trying to tell you something. Um, they don't consider the fact that this is the end. And this is a preacher's message. You could tune in to most of these preachers 20 years ago, 30 years ago, get the same message. Exactly. And I feel sorry for the ones who are sitting in those congregations that are drinking the same warmed over stuff every week. I've gone to different services on the internet. I've come across a new expression for me called praise breaks. That's just play shouting music and people just shout for oh, all service. It's called a praise break. <laughs> we take a praise break one time. We all just shout. I'll sit and watch it. Don't watch a good shout. <laughs> Something really dance. <laughs> and these teachers will turn their turn away their ears from the truth. And because they turn their ears from the truth, they shall be turned unto fables. I spoke on this verse many years ago. That there is a you 
truth frequency. Play the radio. To catch 101.1 K Earth, you have to tune your dial to that frequency. Then you can hear the, the broadcast. To hear God's voice, you have to turn to God's frequency. And those who want to leave his frequency would we'll call it the mana network. Leave the mana network. Go to Crawl.com. <laughs> it's saying here, once they turn their ears from the truth, God then tunes their ears from the truth. Then they'll get back again. They have an idea, the church has no idea what a serious problem, what a serious situation the Word of God is. What has made this ministry unique and God speaking him unique over the years is one thing. I don't just preach out the word, but every message God gives us is about the word. Think about it. Every single one of them is about the word and the faith that should come from hearing the word. Where as opposed to reading a text and then telling a story. Joel Osteen to me is the best. I read a text and tell the story. He can do it. And I would look there and watch him sometime, and he's got 35,000 people in the stadium mesmerized over some wonderful human interest story that has back into the Word, and there's no faith preached at all. None. Because we're not speaking what God said. Again, if it's God speaking, he should be talking to all these so called called people about the last days. Somebody should get the clue pretty soon that he's coming soon. Who's preaching that? Oh, they say it as a uh, sort of perfunctory, just to say, you know, mention, you know, the Lord's coming soon. Usually when they're, when they're raising an offering, they take folks through a guilt trip to give them more money. So, you know, the Lord's coming soon. We've got a great work to do for the Lord. Come, we're going to do it. And, you know, do it to your pockets and make it, make it happen. Right? That's not the only publicity the coming of the Lord gets by itself. It gets them to know. I had another message on the tonight. The Lord will change it. I'm not sure he actually gave it. But it was on my mind Monday and Tuesday when God has talked to us and speaking to us about this body being dissolved and so on and so forth and the undersea desiring to be called upon if you have anybody. And rather than look forward to actually leaving the earth and getting out of our troubles and problems. He put the emphasis on the fact that we ought to be, our affection should be set above. He said, I'm not. He made it very clear. Then he spoke to me more about it a whole lot on Monday. Where I was just pretty sure it was going to be the class tonight. But then the Lord reminded me that he's not cracking heads right now. He's confirming the 25%. That's the only thing about the message they had a conflict with me, but I am allowed to say this much about it. Israel. Check, check me out. Let me just study for you. Israel lost track of Canaan. It was like Canaan didn't even exist. And the, you, you figure, you know, you got 600,000 came out of Egypt. They're in the waters for 40 years. They grew to the millions. I would just say that most historians and scholars say that 1.2 million came out. I mean, women and children. That's the city. And all the things that happen in city life and day to day life happen with them. And they got caught up in the daily affairs of the city. And because of the affairs they're caught up in, they're constantly murmuring and complaining to God about what they were going through. Never putting those things in their place and realizing that whatever I'm going through, I'm going to Canaan. I'm going to go to a house I didn't build. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about these vineyards 
that he said you're not gonna plant. Mm -hmm. You know, just you just move in. Move to the house, the furniture's there, the vineyard's planted, the garden's there, the grapes are there, everything else is all ready to go. You just occupy it. You never find a single discussion in their entire history after that manner. Not one. They did accuse Moses a lot of not taking them there. This promise thing, she promised, you know, we ain't got there yet. Right? You know, it's like anything they said about it was said in a negative way in the sense that we ain't there yet. You know, Lord, you, you didn't come in 97. You didn't come in 2010, 2011. We ain't got there yet. And so they get involved in affairs on the earth with each other. Corey, they from Byron, Miriam, and Aaron, little things they got involved into, so on and so forth. A whole lot of little things happened in that city. And they got involved in their neighbor's affairs, their neighbor's problems, and this, that, and so on and so forth. Then once in a while something would affect the entire congregation, like there's no water to drink. So they all gang up on Moses. You know? Nobody ever took the attitude that we can deal with this. We're not going to live in the wilderness. This is not the promised land. We're just passing through this to get to the promised land. And so whatever we're going through, then we go through it. You know? Those who got married, nobody made them get married. That was something they decided to do. Those of you got, those of you got married, that's something you decided to do. That's your wife, that's your husband, live with. Amen. They're your children, live with. I'm not complaining about you know, everything I'm going through, this, you know, and so on and so forth. Those are your decisions that you made. Good or bad, right or wrong, they're yours. You know, but don't let them eclipse heaven. Amen. And, you know, we, we, that's, and that's what Israel did. They let their personal problems make them forget that they were actually called to go to Canaan. They forgot about Canaan. Canaan was pretty much a myth. Well, yeah, maybe one day we'll get there. I dare say knowing human nature became a joke. So well, I guess I guess we're going to Kansas today, huh? And that cloud began to move. There is a tabernacle. They just spoke to the cloud. So where are you going to take us today? Canaan? It became a joke with them. Don't let the here and now take you out of the later. Okay? Amen. Well, I watched on all things. I hate reading this verse. Endure afflictions. I prayed too many times for the Lord to take this affliction away. Lady God is simply saying, endure it. Why well, don't want to endure it? According to this, I have no choice. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist, talking to Timothy again, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am not ready to be offered as a sacrifice. And the time of my departure is at hand. Like I said, Paul wrote this, but we can say the same thing now. How much more at hand is our departure than it is now? What is it, 47 days now? It's at hand. Our departure is here. I should be thinking about my departure. Yeah. And more so, I have fought a good fight. The question you ask yourself is, have you? And those are the 25% category. You have. And tonight, God, I think, is going to show us and emphasize to us what constitutes a good fight. Right? I believe that's the class tonight. Second Timothy chapter two. Same uplifting words, verse three. Thou therefore in their hardness. Thou therefore endure a hardness. What is that? Anything I don't like. How many times you pray, Lord, just take this away from me? And I'll be okay. 
I didn't expect this. And so sometimes God does. He takes it away and then gives you another hardness. He says to endure hardness, why would we think that any part of this trip is not going to be about hardness? Right. He said prayer for his removal. Mm -hmm. Just go through it. Whatever hardness God is allowed to come your way, he says endure hardness. As what? Good As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What, is it, what makes a good soldier? No man that warreth and taineth himself with the affairs of this life. You don't get entangled with the affairs of his life. A good soldier, you can, go, you can get married in the military. Yeah, military, I live in a military base, in military housing. I got married. And I have two children living in military housing. Those are the affairs of this world. But when it's time to get underway, and the ship is leaving, I had to go. That's part of the hardness of what I was in. means that you can leave your family at any moment without notice. And they can't, they won't give you a date as to when you're sleeping again. If it's a secret mission, you can't even take your family where, you, where, where you're going. No mail leaves the ship, no transmission. You can have a cell phone in the middle of the ocean and get a call nobody. Okay? What's your whole focus? Policing the one who calls you to be a soldier. And being a soldier is a tough line. You agree? Yeah. It's not like being a civilian. But there's the difference in being a soldier. Somebody's always telling you what to do. 24-7. So he says what? Endure harvest. Endure somebody telling you what to do. Like a good soldier. Verse I'm after is verse 5. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. So what constitutes a good fight. A good fight, in God's eyes, is somebody fighting who's playing by the rules. Alright? That's okay first, playing by the rules. That's what we're saying here. We talk about this that he had in mind the the games being played in the Colosseum in Rome. He said, you strive for mastery, and you're not crowned. You're not crowned striving for the masteries on steroids. Ask a few baseball players, they've been more or less than blacklisted because you know, their great accomplishments have been obliterated because they're taking a, a drug that enhances their ability to perform. Hey. Barry Bonds, who I respect a great man, has a kind of lost a little respect for him. I found that he was hitting with a little edge. He wasn't striving lawfully. Pete Rose pretty much banned from baseball. I'm trying to ease him back in again now. You know, things happened a long time ago. The world forgives you and lets you back into the fold again. But he was betting on baseball games. And of course, Pete denies to this day that he ever betted against Cincinnati Reds, so he played for it. But that's doubtful. Because he had the kind of ability that as one man, he could change the whole game. I believe he bet against the Reds sometimes. I'll be sometimes he's better for it. That has never really been proven. He said it didn't. But there's no crown except we strive lawfully. Now in the fight, in this fight we're in, we have two enemies. Or 
human. Enemy. And we're fighting this man invisible. An alien. And or spiritual enemy. When you can't see. The description in Hebrews. You know, help me find it. Chapter 11. Where it says they put to flight the armies of the aliens. Kingdom, brought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lying, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. See what aliens is talking about here? I think it's talking about those. First thing, it's talking about a spiritual war that took place, or taking place, or by what caused the enemies, the armies of the aliens, to run from us. They're going to still come down there. You know, the fight, the walker, is still going on. Let's deal with the visible enemy first, the human one. Turn to Luke chapter 6. But I say unto you, which hear, you know that. I don't like that. I'm going to go further like that. I'm going to go back to the warfare and the Ephesians. But I say unto you, which hear, love your enemies. I didn't know what a monumental command this was until the last four or five years. To actually know you have enemies, and the human nature is this, our natural makeup to get even. Right? Better yet, get rid of them. I never stood fighting in the street. I never stood fighting. 